Let me bring you up to date on where we were in our story. Last week, uh, Peter has taken Paul up to, or Saul up to Caesarea, put him on a boat, and send him home to his hometown of Tarsus. Throughout Israel, all of Israel, the Christians are still very uneasy and, 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 and un, un, unrest. The news of Saul's conversion has not traveled as fast as the news of his persecution of the years that he was persecuting the church. And so Christianity is very uneasy. And Peter has gone up to Caesarea. He's put Paul on that boat in that town. And off uh, Paul went, or Saul went, on his 300-mile journey north. He gets off the boat. He gets on a little boat, travels up the river about 12 miles, and he's at his hometown of Tarsus. And he is going to stay there about 11 years. Now, folks, we don't know he's going to stay there 11 years yet. I'm telling you that because I know the rest of the story. Uh, in, in the story, we just know that he has... Uh, been up in, uh, uh, in um, Damascus, and then he's gone over into Arabia and come back to Damascus for 11 years, I mean for three years. And in fact, last week I had a timeline uh, on the board, and I've, I'm going to use another one today, but last week we knew that he had been let down outside, in a, through the window in a basket uh, on the outside of of the city of Damascus when Artus was in control of Syria and we know that Artus took over control of Syria in 37 AD and Paul or Saul was already a Christian at that point in time and had already gone over at least three years. He had already gone over to uh, uh, Arabia and already come back when he lets down in the basket and then he heads down to Jerusalem for 15 days. From the 15 days he's picked up by the apostles and they go to Syria and send him home. And then we're going to find out later he's gone for 11 years. So that's 14 years. So I want to show you a little bit more about the hiccup that we're dealing with. Um, Artus is in control of Syria in 37 AD. We've got a hiccup coming up. Uh, what I have got here, I've put the, the date of AD 63 and I put in the 14 years. That's three years that Saul went to Arabian back, was in Damascus, plus 11. That's 14 years. We're going to come up against a bumper of a date that Paul has to have been a Christian longer than 14 years at that date. In 50 AD, they're going to have in Acts chapter 15, and we're chapter 11, but in Acts chapter 15, they're going to have what's called the Council of Jerusalem. Now, this is going to be the first Christian council of the church of which there will be many Christian councils uh, to follow. Uh, during the first uh, hundred years, they're going to have them regularly. But by 150 A.D., after the first hundred years, 100 years after this, they're going to start having them only every 100 years. The, the church is only going to get together to review what has happened every 100 years. And you know some of those because you've been to school and you've heard of them. You've all heard of the Council of Trent. You've all heard of the Council of Nicaea. You've all heard of the Council of Constantinople. And in all these councils, there's one every hundred years. If you have any uh, Catholicism in your background, you've heard of the council called Vatican I, which was in the 1800s. And then you've heard of the Council of Vatican II, which was in the 1960s. All around the 50 dates, somehow, somewhere in there. And they're not just a quick council meeting. They're a council meeting that actually goes on for several years. Uh, for those of you all who remember Vatican II, it was in Vatican II where they decided that the priest in the Catholic Church would stop talking like this in his message passed up to the altar, and they pulled the altar around and he would start talking to the people this way. It was in Vatican II where they allowed for the Mass to be done in some language other than Latin, if you remember. That's in Vatican II where they're going to get, even allow uh, for Scripture to be in the hands of the people. and so, They're going to allow it. It's already been going on, folks, okay? But they're going to allow Scripture to be in the modern language of English or whatever language was in, in Vatican II, and that's okay. Uh, in Vatican II, they're going to answer the problem that John Glenn had as a Catholic when he went into space. John Glenn went into space, and they didn't know if he was going to come back, remember? And so he had been through five of the uh, 
uh, sacraments, and, and a person has to go through six of the seven sacraments. Uh, the six and seven is, is you either have to get married or you have to take orders. You got that? I mean, that's number five and six. And then number seven is you have to have extreme unction. Well, uh, John Glenn had, had uh, gotten married, so he's not going to have to do the, take the uh, orders or become a nun or a priest, but he's going to miss the final rites if he dies while he goes off in space. So he went up, and that, that just caused a problem. So Vatican II came along and said, well, you can do this call thing called now extreme unction, where if you think you're going to be in a situation where you might die, and you think a priest won't be nearby to do the final rites over you, you can do it ahead of time. So that was all done in Vatican II. That, those are all council meetings that are grandchildren council meetings of this very first council meeting. It happens in 50 A.D. in Jerusalem, and they're going to handle the issue of does a Gentile have to become a Jew before he can become a Christian? And that will actually blossom here in a few minutes in this lesson. We've got a problem and a hiccup in that Paul is there. And by that time, Paul not only is there, but he is a, looked upon as a leader in the Christian church, and he, Paul and Peter get at it. I mean, they are arguing back and forth. And the people are allowing them to argue, back, argue the topic back and forth. P Paul has already been on his first missionary journey, and that took two years. It's been completed. It takes two years. So, if we know that Paul is out for 14 years while he's basically been training, and then he goes on his missionary journey... Now we've got to add on two more years, at least two years. So we at least two years gets back to A.D. 34 for these two years. The two years are really here, but we've got to move this all back. So now we're back to the time of this is where I told you last week is probably the year that Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. It's going to get very difficult because... When we get over to him being coming down, let down in the basket, we know that in the basket, when he's let down in the basket, he has only been a Christian for three years. So in 37, he's only been for three years. So this is our timeline. This is where we have to work with. That's about as close as we can get to it to know when Paul was converted. It can't go, you know, we could say, okay, we could go over here to 38 AD, but then we've got a problem. We have 14 years plus 2, and that takes us over into 51, and the council happened in 50. So we've got these bumpers that we have to work into. So everything looks like Saul was saved on the Damascus Road in 34 AD because of the things that are going to happen. Well, <clears throat> after putting Saul on the boat to Caesarea, Peter... Heads on back. He's going to head back to Jerusalem. He leaves Caesarea. He's going south on the road. He gets to Lydda. There in Lydda, he heals the man. And lo and behold, the entire, entire town of Lydda joins the church on that day and is converted. Not only the entire town of Lydda, but also the entire plain of Sharon. Everybody who lives around that 30-mile plain of Sharon becomes part of the Christian church. It is a Christian-friendly uh, 30 miles. He gets down to Joppa and he, he raises Tabitha from the dead and many of the people in Joppa come to know the Lord as Savior. It is not a totally Christian town, but it's pretty much a Christian town, Christian friendly. And, and Peter is able to stay there in the house of Simon the Tanner uh, without any trouble whatsoever from the people of the town who are non-Christians. So that's where we pick up. Up north, back in Caesarea, where Peter had put Saul in the boat, there is a centurion man who the Lord is dealing with. His name is Cornelius. Cornelius is a very favorable and familiar name in the Roman Empire. Not as far as being rulers or leaders, but as far as being military people. All the lineages of the Corneliuses... They were all freed slaves, or at least the beginnings of them were. They were freed slaves who became soldiers and were known for their loyalty and their fierce fighting in the Roman militia or, or, or um, army. And so if you had the name Cornelius and you were a man, 
you were pretty well set to be chosen to be one of the leaders in the army. And that's what Cornelius is. He is a centurion and he is a leader. And we'll see that as we go through the text here. Starting with Acts chapter 10 verse 1 in our Bible study. Let's look at that. It says, Now there was a certain man of Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Italian cohort. Italian cohort. That means they speak Italian. They are from Italy. They also speak probably Greek, and they also speak probably Latin, because Latin is the language that is still being used in Italy in the, in the court systems. So they're using Latin. They probably they speak Italian too. Cornelius is a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. In other words, when a poor Jew came along, he was reaching down to his pocket to give to help that poor Jew. It was not, we're not talking about alms being given to the church because you never give alms to a church. That's an offering. Alms is when you give something to someone uh, outside of the church. <clears throat> well, he does that. Verse 3. Now the, nine o'clock, now the ninth hour, that's nine o'clock in the morning, of the day, he clearly saw a vision, an angel of God, who had come to him, into him, and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze upon him, and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a a certain tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who, who was speaking to him had departed, he summoned two of his servants. So he's a centurion who has servants, and he has a devout soldier that goes along with them. They were in constant attendance upon him, and after he explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Okay, so we have a centurion who has authority over men. That means he's not just a centurion, he has a power of position in the centurion rank. He is of the Italian cohort, which means a cohort is a group of 1,000 men. Remember I explained that to you when we talked about Pilate took Jesus to the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he was accompanied by a cohort of Italian Roman centurions who followed him through that very narrow street called the Via della Rosa all the way to Calvary. And so if you were a person who was trying to see Jesus go down that small little roadway that had houses on either side of it, you had to look through your windows or stand in your doorway because a thousand men were accompanying Jesus on the way to the cross. And after they put him on the cross, the thousand men stood there until he was dead, protecting to make sure that it happened. That's the reason why we hear that Mary and the other disciples, Mary the mother of Jesus and the other disciples were at a distance because the the gospel text tells us they were at a distance. Why? Because there's a thousand men around Jesus and the other two thieves to make sure that he stays on the cross. (laughs) He's from Caesarea. Uh, Cornelius is from Caesarea. Caesarea is the most modern city in that part of the world. At this point in time, it is about 50 years old or 55 years old. It was begun to be built by Herod the Great in 25 B.C. It's finished a lot about 11 B.C. It is a city that has a seaport there to where all the news from Rome, uh, from the governmental news, comes into Caesarea, comes to the military officers who live in Caesarea in the nice brick homes and all of that, mud brick homes, and from there the uh, Roman army goes out of Caesarea to do what they're supposed to do. It is an incredible town. Everything you need is there. It is almost all military people, although not all the military people were full-time military paid people. Most of the people in Caesarea, the men, were volunteers in the Roman army. They were Gentile volunteers. And of course, during the day, they had their farms and they had their metal shop and they had all these other things that they did. But whenever it came time for the something to happen, they would put those skills down, they'd leave their jobs, and they put on their uniforms, and they became a centurion soldier. 
Out of every 1,000 men cohort, there were 10 men in that cohort that were paid soldiers all the time. That means when they went out into the streets, they had on it their uniform and everything. They were considered the leader of the 10 leaders of the cohort, and each one of those 10 men controlled 99 volunteers. So there's 100 in each one of their sections. Now, so uh, there's 10 men, each, have a, each are in 100 group at a time, including themselves, or 99 with them, it's 100. 10 times 10 is 1,000, that's a cohort. So uh, each uh, man, centurion, only had to make contact with 99 people to get his uh, part of the 1,000 back together whenever they had to go do something. That's the way it was divided down. In fact, I, it was even divided down even smaller than that. And it even gets bigger than that because a legion is 10 cohorts or, or 10,000 uh, cohorts. Uh, 10 cohorts makes a legion. So, and they kept on going up after that even more. So that's how the army was organized very, very effectively so that you could get the volunteer guys out very quickly. Joppa, on the other hand, is a very ancient seaside shanty town. Now, I hate to use this example, but this is a very good example, and I imagine everybody here knows what I'm talking about. If you remember, uh, there was a movie out many years ago, about 15, 15 years ago, where Robin Williams played Popeye. Okay? Do you remember the shanty town that he rose up to? And, and, and his boat, and the houses are all leaning this way and leaning that way. That's what we're talking about Joppa. Joppa did not have any mud bricks homes. It had wooden homes that were, could be blown away by the storm that came in. If a storm came in off of the Mediterranean, it was blown away. They had to rebuild it. If you went up on top of the roof for anything, you had to pray that they didn't fall down. Uh, that type of situation. So we've got a man who is in a, in a mud brick home, the most modern home in the world of the day, with devout servants underneath him. He can command soldiers, and he actually commands one of them to go with his servants down to Joppa to get Simon. Uh, we've got all this luxury that's up there in Caesarea, and they, he is sending down to a very shanty, shaky, uh, stinky seaside town uh, that... The tanner has to be there. All the tanning shops are down by the seashore because they need the salt and the salt water to tan the hides. You got That's part of the process. So that's where they are getting their materials and their, their chemicals to do tanning of the hides. So they're there by the seashore. And they send down to this poor area where it's almost all Jews. And Joppa is almost all Jews. Uh, and, and they're sending down there to get a poor, lonely poor man of God to come up and share with a very wealthy man. It's an interesting concept as we see everything that is happening that is going on in this story. Well, let me see. Where did I leave off? What verse am I left off? Verse 10 is where I'm going to pick up. I read all that. I read verse 7. Yes, send down to Joppa. Good. Okay, let's go to verse 9 on the next page. <coughs> And on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Catch what happened here. The angel has spoken to Cornelius in Caesarea. It's 40 miles away. He gathers up his servants and a soldier, three guys, sends them on down. The Lord doesn't even speak to Peter about this until the very next day. It's going to be a two-day journey from Caesarea to Joppa, and so, the Lord waits for Peter to find out about what's going to happen till the next day. That's interesting. So, it's the sixth hour. That means that uh, it is, uh, it's about noon in the, in the Jewish calendar. It's, and he goes and he says it's a time for him to pray. Verse, oh, by the way, <clears throat> sixth hour is noon. Those of us who think about the Muslims who always go out to have their five times of praying per day, that is not something new to religion. When Muhammad was a Jew for a little over a year before the Jewish people kicked him out of Judaism, Jews have always, from the time of coming out of the wilderness, had a time where they prayed five times a day. Remember back in Daniel where he goes to pray at the different hours of prayer and things like that? Noon is just a time where you go and have spend time in prayer. It doesn't matter whether you're hungry or not. You go and you spend time in prayer. 
So it is noon time. Peter goes up on top of the house. He is going for his regular time of prayer. It is a Jewish thing. And Peter hasn't let go of it in the church. In fact, we're going to find a little bit more about that in just a minute. And it says, And he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. That word hunger, the word hungry is in the Bible a lot. But the word hunger with the ending that's on this word is only found here in the Bible. And it means what we would understand to mean he was very, 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 very hungry. Remember, they're poor down in Joppa. No telling whenever they had their last meal. And here he, they finally are going to prepare a meal. And he is very hungry, but it's time to pray. So he goes up on top of the housetop to pray. And it says they're preparing the food. So he's probably even smelling it, cooking on the outside cookery, because they don't cook inside these shanty houses. They didn't even cook in the mud houses either at this point in time. So they're cooking outside. He can smell it. He's up on top of the roof. Just picture this in your mind. He's thinking about how hungry he is, and he falls into a trance. 11. And he beheld the sky open, and a certain object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground, and there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of, all, of the earth and the birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again, a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Three times the Lord tells him to eat of this stuff that's inside this sheet, and three times Peter politely says, No, Lord, I've never eaten anything unholy in my life. Can't do this unclean thing. Have never touched any unclean whatsoever. Now, hang on a second. <coughs> Peter is Jewish, but he is now Christian. <clears throat> but he can't let go of Jewish traditions. You see, back in the Old Testament, the Lord is the one who said in Leviticus, Okay, you're coming out of Egypt. Folks, listen. I know we all think, when we think about Jewish people in the Old Testament, we think in our mind about guys in long robes and long beards and all this biblical type of things that we think about that we see them in in the days of Jesus. When those, when those people left Egypt, they looked like Egyptians. They were dressed like Egyptians. They wore gold and silver and hung out all over their bodies like Egyptians. That's where they gathered all the stuff that was... Because when they went to leave, their masters gave them these things, things to wear and all this type of stuff. They left looking like Egyptians. They don't start looking like uh, what we consider biblical people until the Lord hands down the Levitical law that we have in the book of Leviticus. The Lord wants the Jews to look like something different from the rest of the world, and so he gives the instructions about when the men can cut their beard and when they can't cut their beard, of what, kind, what they can do as far as tattoos and cuttings on their body, of what kind of robes and everything. That all happens in the book of Leviticus in the wilderness, not when they leave Egypt. So when you see the Ten Commandments and Cecil B. DeMille having all our people, all the Jewish people leaving, and they all look different than the Egyptians, that's not the way it was. They look, Listen, those brothers of Joseph did not recognize Joseph because he was dressed like them? Like back home? No, he was dressed like an Egyptian. They even gave Joseph's his father Jacob an a Egyptian burial. They embalmed him and mummified him before Joseph took him back and put him in the cave with Abraham and his, and his mother. And Isaac, his father, and his mother, and Abraham, his grandfather. They looked like Egyptians when they left. The book of Leviticus is a book that tells us God wanted his people to look different. And so in the book of Leviticus, God wrote down, this is my list of clean things and this is my list of unclean things for my Jewish people. 
Here, he brings down a sheet and he says, Peter, eat. Now, this is God, the same God that gave the list over here in the Old Testament for the Jews. And Peter has not given up the list. He still knows the list. I'm sure in that sheet there was uh, pepper-boiled shrimp <laughs> and a big old slice. Well, no, it was an animal. He was supposed to kill and eat, wasn't he? Well, there was, there was honey-baked ham in that sheet, okay? You got that? It just wasn't honey-baked yet, all right? I never will forget, we were on a cruise, our very first cruise. That morning, it was, in fact, it, it happened on that day. We were, we um, actually happened the next morning. On, it was December the 4th of whatever year that was, and we had just found out that Kay, we were supposed to leave for the cruise that day, and we found out that Kay was pregnant with Madison, and she didn't want to go on the cruise because she didn't want to lose the baby. You know what I'm well, we just found out that I think you're okay. Let's go ahead and go. So the next morning we go to the table. First thing in the here is sitting across from us is this guy by the name of Abraham Gooey and his wife Elizabeth. <clears throat> and they're looking and they're saying at the menu, and of course you've got, you know, pages and pages of things that you can those of you been on cruise, you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> and this older couple, they're in their they're in their he, she's in her late 70s, he's in his 80s, and, and they said, I don't know what we're going to get. And my wife says, well, the ham and eggs is really good. <laughs> and I went, they don't eat ham and eggs. And Elizabeth said, how did you know that? How did you know we were Jewish? I said, oh, I could just tell. Abraham Gooey, his name ended up being, you ought to know, most of y'all will not remember, well, some of y'all remember this name. Uh, Abraham Gooey worked for the Duncan Yo-Yo Company, and he is the man that we used to see when Duncan Yo when he you know, was in, was advertising the Duncan Yo-Yo Yo-Yos. Got that? And doing all this stuff. And this is who he was. He was famous with Duncan Yo-Yo. That's what he did all his life until he retired. And then he became a stockbroker. <laughs> After that, taking care of retirement funds. And he had this gold yo-yo that had been given to him at his retirement over on the side, up on, his, on a shelf. And one of the clients came and said, aren't you Abraham Gooey? Abraham, you're the one who used to be, he used to be the yo-yo man. He said, yes, I was. He took it off to do a trick. And lo and behold, he hit him his eye, put his eye out. Isn't that terrible? Well, Abraham Go Gooey, well, well, I noticed that he was writing his name longer than Gooey. And I said, how do you get Gooey out of that? He said, well, my name is really Goldstein. But he said in the, whenever the, the, the Duncan Yo-Yo people decided that people probably wouldn't buy yo-yos if they knew I was a Jew, so we shortened it to Gooey. It was really interesting. We got back off of that trip, and we took him around. We did everything with him. You know, we, we tend to latch on to, to more mature people, I'll put it that way. They called us the next week, and they said, Hey, we're going, on, we're going on a cruise in the summer. If you'll go to Alaska with us, we'll pay for it. We said, Oh, well, we just found out Madison's going to be showing up, so I don't think we'll do that. We kept up with them for a few years, and both of them finally died. It was a wonderful, wonderful couple. But they were tied to their traditions. You got that? Tied to their traditions. They were not going to eat, even out on a cruise, when there wasn't anybody to see to have a little ham. You don't put a ham inside of yourself. Not whatsoever. Uh-uh, not going to do that. Can't do that. Well, <clears throat> well, they, uh, Peter understands that the Lord is saying, hey, that stuff's clean. It's okay. I said it's clean. He's rewriting the rules. Verse 17 says, Now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, um, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate, and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. <laughs> Isn't that just like God? Everything else works, and he tells you last. you got to do it, but he tells you last. Everybody else knows, but he tells you last. Peter, he wakes up from the trance. He's still very hurt, hungry. I do have a question. Had Peter killed and eat, would he have been hungry when he woke up? Probably not. We'll find out when we get to heaven, won't we? All right. Well, it's so interesting, though. The natural is so close to the supernatural at all times. At all times. Uh, hunger. Hunger when Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days, after the 40 days is over, he becomes hungry, and that natural instinct of hunger allows Satan to come to tempt him after the 40 days is over. It's Mark chapter 4. 
Here he's hungry. The Lord uses the hunger as a uh, kickoff to bring something supernatural in his life. In fact, there's not a person in here who came to know the Lord as Savior that you did not come at some point when something was going on in your natural life that you realized you needed something supernatural in your life. Got it? None of you came to the Lord just because you thought, hey, that'd be a great thing to do, isn't it? It just doesn't work that way. Because in the time of plenty, you don't need anything. But in the time of need, even if you just see someone who you want to be like them because, and they have Christ in their life and you want to be like that, that's still a time of natural need. If you're a nine-year-old and you're just looking at someone and says, I want to be like him. And he's a Christian and I want that. I don't want what I've got right now. I want that. That's still a time of need. It's a natural thing mixed with this supernatural thing. And so Peter wakes up from this trance. The guys are downstairs. They're knocking. He's thinking, oh my soul, what is that? And while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But arise, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings. For I have sent them myself. And Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear a message from you. And so he invited them in and gave them lodging. Those men have been on the road for two days. He goes down and says, Hey, I'm here. I'm the one you want. The Lord's told me I'm the one you want. And the Lord told me to go without any misgivings. <coughs> misgivings is one of those words that we don't always understand, especially today. We could translate that word with many other words to gather up what that means. You could say the Lord said to him, Peter, I want you to go without misgivings, to go without qualms, to go without doubts, to go without worries, to go without uncertainties, to go without reservations, to go without fear, to go without superstitions. Just get up and go. And he's supposed to go to the house of a Gentile, and that is forbidden in Jewish law. He, and so then he turns around and does this. Men, I'm supposed to go with you. Come on in and spend the night. And that is forbidden by Jewish law. It's forbidden. The rabbis, you'll never find in anywhere in the Old Testament where it's ever forbidden to interact and to do private business or to do, have a private family meeting with a, anyone of a different nationality. We're supposed to all join in together. But the rabbis, after the wilderness experience, had written in this Talmud thing, this Old Testament Talmud thing. I've got a full copy of it. By the time of Jesus, they're not teaching Scripture anymore. They're teaching the teaching of the rabbis in the Talmuds where they've ar two or three rabbis will argue out something in the Talmud and they'll record it and what their conclusion is. And you'll look at the argument and you'll go, well, that doesn't make sense to me. And what they've figured out doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't match anything in the Bible. That's where they got these 613 laws from that you had to follow. And so they're telling the, the, rabbi, the rabbis are teaching what the rabbis taught, not what the Bible was by the time of Jesus' day. The rabbis had come up with this deal is you could, you could have business with a Gentile and sell your stuff to a Gentile, but you could not have them into your home. You could not feed them in your home. You could not go into their home. You could not spend the night with them. That was against the law and you were going straight to torment if you did that and you were going to be excommunicated from the Jewish faith if you were going to do that. That's all in the Jewish regulations. <coughs> it is not lawful. You break the law by doing that. Well, going on, verse 23b says, And on the next day he arose and he went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. How many brethren? You don't know here. We're going to find out in chapter 11. Six Jewish Christians go with Peter to Cornelius' house. We don't know that yet. But we're going to find it out before the lesson is over in the text. So people go with. Peter doesn't go alone. All right? And on the following day, which is on the next day, he entered Caesarea. So that's been a four-day journey. Now Cornelius, I mean four days for the first men. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he had called together his relatives and his close friends. So Cornelius, who knows it's a two-day journey down there, and it's a two-day journey back, 
has gathered the entire family of his and his friends. A congregation of people is waiting for Peter to show up. You got it? And he's waiting and he's ready because he knows that Peter is going to come with a word from the Lord. Hmm. Peter doesn't know what he's going to get into when he leaves Joppa. But he goes anyway. He takes these six men and when he gets there, uh, he's going to meet with Cornelius, and here he does. He says, And when it came about that Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. Two things happened here. Two cultures clashed is what happened. We can just run over that really quickly and go on down, not think anything about it. What happened was, Cornelius was a soldier. And he was a loyal soldier. And even loyal soldiers would bow in honor to someone of great authority, whether it was their generals or someone of political power. They would go down, they'd put their hands over their chest, and they would kneel. It is a natural thing and a natural greeting for a lifetime soldier. To Peter, he read it wrong. Peter thought he was bowing to worship. Cornelius was simply bowing to give honor to and thanks for coming. Peter says, get up, I am just a man. Peter didn't understand it because Peter's a fisherman. He's not a lifetime soldier. So he misreads it, or at least that's the way I read it. Verse 27. And when he, ta when he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he asked them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising my, any objection when I was sent for. And so I asked, for what reason have you sent me? There he tells you, it's not lawful for him to be there. But I came anyway, and here I am. So why have you sent for me? And Cornelius is going to answer him. Four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. That means it is the ninth hour and Peter, when Peter is there on this day. And uh, uh, same time, four days earlier, he was praying. Cornelius was praying. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said to me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. And so I sent to you immediately and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all present here before God to hear what you have been commanded by the Lord. So Cornelius, in his gentle yet authoritative military way, apologizes for bringing Peter there. You have been kind enough to come, he says. Thank you for being kind enough to come. Here we are. We are all waiting to hear a word from God, whatever God has commanded you to tell us. Well, up until this point, there was not a single Christian in Christianity who did not have some attachment to Judaism or Jews. Let's look at this. On the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> well, just like the day of Pentecost, the apostles and the church are up, 120 are up in the upper room. The Holy Spirit descends upon them and has tongues that look like fire, but they're not fire, touch them, that giving them the Holy Spirit. And the eleven apostles begin to speak in languages that are known languages that they have never learned because they're ignorant people. Now in the rest of the city around Jerusalem, there are people there who have all come to worship on the day of Pentecost who are Jews by both birth and by faith. They're born Jews, they've got Jewish blood in them, and they're Jews by birth and by faith. There are also Jews there in the day of Pentecost who are there, and they are called proselytes because they have come to Judaism by faith and faith alone. They're missing this part, the birth. 
These are Gentiles who have become fully Jew. The men have gone through circumcision and all that. They have become Jewish by faith. They're called proselytes at the gate. So they have Jewish faith, and then the Jews have Jewish uh, bloodline and faith. And on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles leave out of the upper room about 10 o'clock and begin to speak in these known languages that they had never learned, these Jewish proselytes from every nation under heaven <clears throat> said, oh, how are we hearing these? Aren't these men Galileans and ignorant men? How are we hearing them speak in our own language and they're doing it perfectly? This is the miracle that happened and Peter gets up and gives his 534 word message and that day 3,000 people come to be part of the church. They all have some sort of Judaism in them. Philip later on is selected to be one of the seven that serves the tables. The stoning of Stephen happens if you remember. Philip goes north to Samaria and he preaches to the people of Samaria <clears throat> and we have a hiccup in Samaria because we have people up there who are only, how am I going to do this? They are only Jewish by at least half blood because the other half is Gentile blood because Samaritans are half-breeds. They are people who have married Gentiles and their children are different flavors but they got a little Jewish blood in them and they may even... They may even worship as Jews, <coughs> but they, they're not full-blood Jews. And when Peter and when Philip takes the message to them, somebody has to put the stamp of approval on them to show the rest of the Jewish Christ, the Christian Jews that it's okay for the Samaritans, those, those, bad, those, those folks that we're not even supposed to touch. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? The, 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 the religious Jew guy walks on the other side of the street. Remember that? Because the rule says, the law says, don't touch with anybody like that. Don't go into Gentile. And nobody's half, no, if they got Gentile blood in them, you're not supposed to go to them at all. You're not supposed to help them at all. Nothing. Only the Jews were to help. Don't enter into, don't bring them to your house. Don't feed them. Just, you know, go on, do something else with them. Well, these are only half breeds. Well, John and Peter show up for what we can call the day of Pentecost for the Samaritans, but there's no speaking in tongues on this day. Why? Because these people don't have to, don't, they don't have to prove the blood. The Jews are just going to take Peter and John's word for it, and they're, because they're at least got a little bit of blood in them that belongs to the Jewish faith, and so uh, they accept them. So we've got the Samaritan day of Pentecost, but on the, on the Jewish day of Pentecost, we've got this tongues thing that happens on the Jewish day of Pentecost miracle. So, <coughs> Peter begins his message. Look here, verse 34. And opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. How did they already know about that? He says, you yourselves knew. Remember, the Italian cohort was sent to Jerusalem to the synagogues to protect and to keep the Jews and the Christians or Jews and the followers of Jesus and the followers of John the Baptist from killing each other. The Italian soldiers were there. They were there. They know about John the Baptist. They know about the resurrection. He says, you yourselves know. I'm sure as Peter was looking around that room, he saw people he knew that had been there. He recognized their faces. He goes on to say, he says, you yourselves know about the things which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were opposed to, by the devil, oppressed by the devil. For God was with him, and we are witnesses of all the things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they were 
and they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should become visible, not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach the God to the people and solemnly testify that this is the one who has been anointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. You knew about it because you were there. And he says, I understand now that it, this message must go to everybody in the world whoever wants to hear it it must go to him. So Cornelius probably was there at the, at the crucifixion. He's been at the synagogues when he's heard the apostles teaching. He's heard all this and he wants it. And he wants it. And Peter begins to preach. And what he has just said is 239 words. You remember his message on the day of Pentecost was 534 words and 3,000 came to the low of the Lord. But this is a smaller crowd. He only needs 239 words and every one of this household is fixing to get saved. If you remember when he went and he, and he spoke other times, we know the other words too. Remember Stephen? He went into the temple to, to talk to the whole council and he preached to them over 1,500 words and he had them right in the palm of his hand until the last 70 words. It was the last 70 words that got him stoned and started the persecution, started all this conflict that's going on. In other words, I guess it should always be a short message, right? <laughs> the, the moral of the story, 239 words have been said, and look what happens. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed. Circumcised believers. That's another way of saying Jewish Christians. We're not talking about Gentiles. We're talking about Jewish Christians who were there had come. They were amazed. Why were they amazed? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Time out. At the day of Pentecost, it is the, the followers of the Lord who are given the miracle of tongues to go speak so that all the other people will believe. All the rest of them. But here, it's not the believers who are give, being given tongues so others can believe. It's the ones who want to believe who are given the Gentiles. The Gentiles who are there who probably speak Italian, they speak Latin, they speak Greek, they probably speak some Aramaic, and I am willing to bet they are speaking in Hebrew perfectly so these Jews can recognize that the Holy Spirit has done to them exactly what happened to them, but that didn't go over, has happened to the Gentiles is exactly what happened to the Jews on the day of Pentecost so the Jews would believe that the Holy Spirit had actually come to them. In fact, let's go on and we'll see this that I think. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. They received it there, the Gentile day of Pentecost, day of Pentecost for the Gentiles happens here, the Gentiles receive it just like the Jews do up here. Surely we can't, we can't get in the way here, he says. And in order for them to be he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. And he did. He stayed for a few days. Well, bad news travels fast. And sometimes good news gets changed into bad news. Did you know that? And this good news gets changed into bad news and it spreads all over the place. And Peter heads back to Jerusalem and look what happens. Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised, that means the Jewish believers, took issue with him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Huh. I can just imagine what's going on. They are mad. They are furious. They have heard. First of all, he took our gospel that was just our gospel that was just supposed to be just for us, the Jews, and he took it to those Gentiles. 
The next thing he did, he went over and he broke our law by eating with them. He ate with those Gentiles. Can you believe he ate with those Gentiles? Now, some of y'all who have been in another, another church will know exactly what I'm fixing to do. I need a Bible. Anybody got a, Charlie, let me borrow your Bible. <clears throat> he said it was the apostles and the circumcised believers who have had it. They have. Now, from my older days, I've never seen this happen at Sagemont, but I've seen it happen at every other church that I have been at. You ready? Whenever the leaders or the preachers or whatever are upset with something, they take the Word of God, they tuck it underneath, they stay here, they stick out their tummies, and they walk around like this. <laughs> They're ready. You walk in and you don't even know what's going to hit you, but you know something's wrong because... I wonder what this looks like on tape. <laughs> Fixing to go out to the world. I hope some of them ministers that do this, praise God, I just love Jesus. Well, put it on your face. There you go, Charlie. These apostles and these circumcised men, they are waiting. They are, how many of y'all have been from a church and you know exactly what I'm talking about? You, yes, I see those hands. There's testimonies all over here. That's never happened. Those, that, that's hanging on tradi to traditions. Hanging on to traditions that just don't matter. That, you know, <coughs> excuse me, in some of our other churches, I never will forget, I've been, I have served a church when it came time for the Lord's Supper. The preacher, now this wasn't a church thing, this is a preacher deal. The preacher, we had a big foyer, and the preacher says, now it's time, brethren, it's time for us to have the Lord's Supper. And we believe the Lord's Supper is just for those of us who belong to the local congregation of Southern Baptist here at this church. And we're going to invite every one of you who is not a member of this church, or if you're a guest of someone who is a member of this church, we're going to invite you to wait for them out into the, in the foyer while we have our time of the Lord's Supper together. How many of y'all have been in a church like that? Okay. <clears throat> Another thing is like this. <clears throat> we have a person that comes from a BMA Baptist, a missionary Baptist. Now they were, they were born, bred, and buttered Southern Baptist, got saved as Southern Baptist, went to the missionary Baptist church, got, went over there, had to be baptized over there because they weren't missionary Baptist, bat, bunked, dunked. And so they come back to us, and in one of our churches we made this guy who is, was baptized as Southern Baptist, who was baptized as missionary Baptist, get rebaptized as Southern Baptist so he could be in ours. Got that? That's traditions that we hold on to that are just bunk. They just, they're just fruit bruising problems. We got people who have been baptized after they come to know the Lord. They're just problems. In fact, you know, all churches have these things. Catholic Church has got a buku of them. You know, Catholic churches, those priests don't care whether you ever come to church or not until you show up in a Baptist church or a Methodist church, something like that. And then they're going to, that Catholic priest is going to go to the oldest patriarch or matriarch in the family and they're going to say to that oldest person in the family you know that you're the next, you're going to go through the portals and when you do if you get to purgatory and your child has been going over that Baptist church your stay in purgatory is going to be much longer than it probably would have been. You know what I'm talking about don't you? The, 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 the power of the, uh, the yuck that is put on people and, and, and Peter's got it too. He can't go eat with a Gentile. Oh no, he's hanging on to it. Because I can't have that food. No, because it, it's stuff you hangs on to that you don't need to hang on to. That we ought to be embarrassed. I will tell you this. This church, and I've been in this church now, in October this year will be 19 years. And this church has less of those type of things than any church I've ever seen. Stuff. In fact, right now as I stand here, I can't think of a one. I can't think of a one. Oh, well, here we go. He was took. I mean, these, these guys, these circumcised guys and these apostles, these apostles, they ought to know better. They're, they're, they, are, they have got their pistols loaded. Ready to go. Peter's coming in. They want to shoot. Here we go. Peter answers them. Look at this. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, and here's where his message starts. It's nice. It is short. It is 311 words, and that's all it takes to soothe this. You don't have to talk a long time. You don't have to explain. You don't have to complain. You just state the facts and let it go. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky. 
and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze upon it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beast and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. And I also heard a voice saying to me, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing unholy and unclean has ever entered in my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time and said, What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times and everything was drawn back up into the sky. And behold, at that moment three men appeared before the house in which I was staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. And behold, the Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. And these six brethren who were with them also went with me. And we went and entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send a Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. And, we, and he shall speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as, he, just as He did upon us at the beginning. In other words, He's talking about that tongues thing. Happened just as it happened at the beginning for them. It fell upon them. And I remembered what the Lord used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God therefore gave to them the same gift that He gave to us after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, who was I, that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Just 311 words and He has calmed them down. They were ready to go. They had come in from all over the country to talk to Peter when he got back to Jerusalem. And that's all it took to settle it all down. Hmm. So the news of the conversion had swept. It had been, it had been um, rejected and now it's accepted. That the news, the day of the Gen uh, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost for the Gentiles has happened. And it happened to them as receiving the gift of tongues to prove to the Jews that are there and who saw it, that make sure that they understood that the Holy Spirit had gone to them. Now, in Jewish traditions, you only had to have two witnesses uh, to testify for it to be um, accepted as a true witness. And if you had three, it was a fact. Peter had six. He had double what he needed to testify, we heard it happen. Now, there's an interesting fact. It happened on the day of Pentecost, and we're, and we're told about it in the Scripture. It happened on the day of Pentecost for the Gentiles, and we're told about it in the Scripture. It never happens again. Not one single time in the rest of the book of Acts do you ever see anyone speaking in a tongue. It's not even mentioned that way to where they speak in a tongue that is a known tongue that has not been learned whatsoever. You never see in the entire rest of the New Testament, which we have already studied, from the book of Romans to the book of Revelation, you don't see it mentioned one single time where at the giving of the Holy Spirit, someone speaks in tongues. It was a miracle for that day, and it was a miracle for that day, and that miracle has come, and it has not been repeated. Not one single time. Ever. Well, the people who hear this, the Jews... They listen. They accept the fact that the message has gone to the Gentiles. And in next week's lesson, we'll pick up with them heading out to all the parts of the country to share the gospel with the Jews only and no Gentiles because they don't want to give up their little group. They only want the Jews to be saved and not the Gentiles. And so a quick end is going to be brought to that too. Father, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, may we never have the characteristics in our lives of these people who uh, can't give up traditions and past when they're just bunk, Lord. And they just bruise the fruit of bringing people to you. Uh, there are many of us in here that even though the church doesn't have those issues, we tend to have those issues. And Lord, change that in our hearts. 
Maybe we'd be willing to speak to anyone at any time about you and share the gospel. That's our prayer in your son's name. Amen.